Hello everyone and welcome back. So let's take everything we have learned and do a real energy problem. Before we do the real energy problem, we're going to do a bit of a warm up. It uses all the same techniques, but it's just a little bit of a lower level, but it's still a very common problem. We're going to start with this. A roller coaster initially at rest drops from a height of 40 meters. It goes through a loop that is 28 meters high. What is the coaster's velocity at the top of the loop? So I pre-did a setup for us. I have a section for our system, our givens. Very important, a drawing of the situation. I have my coaster up here. It is initially at 40 meters high. It drops down here, goes through the loop. At the top of the loop, it is 28 meters in the air, then finishes going through the loop. There is an assumption here that this coaster is frictionless, which is pretty common unless friction is specifically mentioned. I also have the setup for my bar graph over here, which I will get to in a moment. I'm going to start with my givens. So initial velocity is zero. Final velocity is what we're looking for. Height initial is 40 meters, because the initial point is here. The final point is at the top of the loop, which means height final is 28 meters. Now, if you'll notice, what has not been given to us is the mass of the cart. And since we're definitely dealing with kinetic energy here, because they want the velocity, that is a point of interest. But the fact that we are not given the mass is actually a really big hint that I mentioned earlier. Now, the last time I introduced the bar graph, I put in every single variable. But the truth is, once you list your givens and have a good understanding of what the situation is, the only variables you need to put in your bar graph are the ones you know you're going to use. For example, in my initial state, I definitely have gravitational potential energy because the coaster is 40 meters off the ground. There is no velocity, so no kinetic energy, and there's nothing elastic here. I have my work column and importantly my equal sign. Final state, the coaster is going through the loop, so I definitely have gravitational potential energy, but not as much as the initial state. And I have kinetic energy final because the card has a velocity. So my bar graph would look something like this. Now these bar heights do not have to be perfect, but they should give a rough estimate of the fact that I had a lot more gravitational potential energy in the initial than the final. In fact, some gravitational transferred to kinetic. So something I didn't mention earlier, I actually like to define my system after the bar graph is created because the bar graph literally tells me what types of energy I have and where the energy is located. So in other words, I have gravitational potential energy here, which immediately means the coaster and the Earth are in the system. This is gravitational as well, so the same objects, and kinetic energy is the kinetic energy of the coaster because that is what's going to have the velocity. So my system is now defined. The next question that should be asked is, is all my energy accounted for? And the answer to that question is yes, which means no energy has left my system and no energy has entered my system. Therefore, I do not have to worry about the work column at all. Take my equal sign, I drop it down to here, and then I use my bar graph to literally set up my relationship. MGY initial equals MGY final plus 1F MVF squared. Now immediately, you should notice something algebraically. Every equation here has mass in it, and if I divide by mass, mass will cancel out. Something else I'm going to do is multiply both sides by 2 to get rid of this half. I do that, and I get 2gy initial equals 2gy final plus vf squared. I'm going to subtract this over and factor out the 2g. If I do that, I get 2g height initial minus height final equals vf squared. So something I want you to notice. This is basically the change in height, and I can do this because... Gravitational potential energy is a linear relationship. So VF equals square root 2G, Y initial minus Y final. A little side note while I'm here, the fact that what I just found is a direct comparison to the fourth kinematic equation, if VI is zero, is not an accident. So I get two times 9.8 meters per second squared times 12 meters. Gives me 15.3 meters per second. And a side note, if you're asked, the velocity at the very top would be this way. And little side note, these problems also like to be mixed with centripetal force, which in this case would be force normal from the roller coaster. Plus force gravitational if it's moving fast enough. Okay, now that the warm-up is done, let's do the real problem. And here it is. A block is fired from rest using a 40 newton per meter spring that was displaced 1.8 meters. It slides down a frictionless surface with a 6 meter height. It then slides across a friction pad that is 3.5 meters long. Finally, it rises up another frictional incline with a height of 2 meters. At this point, the block has a velocity of 8.38 meters per second. What is the coefficient of friction on the pad? Now, fortunately, problems like this usually come with a picture, which I'm going to provide. I have a place for my system and givens. Here is the block. It is already scrunched in the spring, scrunched 1.8 meters. This first hill is 6 meters high. 
It's going to go down this first frictionless incline. It's going to go across this friction pad, which will slow it down, then slide up this second incline. And at our final point here, we were given a velocity of 8.38 meters per second. We are after the coefficient of friction on the pad, so at some point we are definitely going to use our force friction equation as well, so I put it here. Let's start with our givens. And to start out, I will begin with the spring. K is 40 newtons per meter, delta D initial is 1.8 meters, and delta D final is 0 meters because it's completely released. Separate these. Height initial is 6 meters, height final is 2 meters, VI is 0 meters per second, VF is 8.38 meters per second. And in this problem, we're going to assume we're given the mass as well. So mass of the block is 3 kilograms. Now, we have a lot of information here and a lot of stuff going on. So this is where something organized like the bar chart is going to come in really handy. You can literally go through each one. Let's start with the initial state. Kinetic energy, no, because the block is not moving. Gravitational potential energy, yes, because the block has initial height. Elastic potential energy, yes, because it is scrunched in the spring. Final state. Kinetic energy, yes, because we know it has a final velocity. Gravitational potential energy, yes, because we know it has a final height. Elastic potential energy, no, because the spring is fully released at this point. Internal energy, now I have a decision to make. Now I need to stop and think about my system. So let's go through this and actually think about my system here. Gravitational potential energy automatically means block and earth are in the system. Kinetic energy means that the block is in the system, I already have that. And elastic potential energy means my spring is in my system. Now, as the block passes over the friction pad, the block will slow down, which means kinetic energy will be removed. That kinetic energy will be transferred into the pad as internal energy. So I'm gonna make the call and put the pad in my system, which means that energy never leaves my system. And then if that energy never leaves my system, that means one, I have internal energy in my problem, and two, I am not dealing with work here. Now, another reminder, this is not an official equation for internal energy. However, in a first year physics course, this is the only equation you will use in regards to it. I will literally take my bar graph and use my bar graph to create a relationship. One more thing I'm going to do is mark this displacement as delta x to separate it from my displacement for the spring. So that is going to be my last given. Now, Using my bar graph, I'm going to create my full relationship in one shot. mg height initial plus one half k delta d initial squared plus one half mvf squared plus mg y final plus force friction delta x. Now I'm going to take my givens and plug them in here. Three kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared times six meters plus one half 40 newtons per meter times 1.8 meters squared plus one half 40 newtons per meter times 1.8 meters squared times one half three kilograms times 8.3 meters per second plus three kilograms times 9.8 meters second squared times two meters plus force friction times 3.5 meters. I will now find all these on 76.4 joules plus 64.8 joules equals 105.3 joules plus 58.8 joules plus force friction times 3.5 meters. Let's reduce this to 41.2 joules equals 164.1 joules plus force friction times 3.5 meters. Reduce that 77.1 joules equals force friction times 3.5 meters. So do the last division and force friction equals 22.0 newtons. Are we done? No, we are not, because we are not after the force friction, although it is very useful because we are after mu, the coefficient of friction. So I'm actually going to borrow this little area here and do a fourth diagram of the block as it moves over the friction pad. I have force earth on block, which is mg. Force normal, since this is a horizontal surface, this is also mg and force friction, which is mu times force normal, which is mu mg. So since force friction equals mu mg in this case, mu is force friction over mg, which is 22 newtons over three kilograms times 9.8 newtons per kilogram. All my units cancel here, and I get a coefficient of friction of 0.749. Okay, so I know this was a lot, but what I want you to concentrate is the fact that I broke it down into smaller pieces. You can't do something this complicated all at once. You have to separate it into bite-sized pieces to turn one very big complicated problem into many smaller, easier problems. The first thing that was important is drawing a picture. Sometimes this is provided for you. The next thing I did is make sure I understood my initial situation and all aspects of it. 
Once again, listing your givens is probably the hardest part of any physics problem. Next, I use the bar graph to clearly define what types of energy I'm dealing with and where the energy is. Alongside this, I created my system. And along the way, I needed to make a decision about internal energy. I decided to keep the pad in the system, so I was using internal energy. Therefore, none of the energy left my system. So therefore, no work. Since I also knew I wanted force friction, I also think using internal made that a little easier for me, mentally at least. And once you have your givens known, and you finish your bar graph, the real key to the problem is making this relationship. Once you make this relationship, the rest is all just math. You've done the physics already, and this energy relationship can be different for every problem you do. That's why something like this can't be memorized. You can remember the base equations down here, but every system could have its own formula. I could easily make a hundred different problems just like this involving all the types of energy we have dealt with, but the skills actually be able to get to this point. Once we got force friction, the rest was just a simple coefficient of friction problem. Okay, so this is a high level energy problem. I actually recommend at some point starting this problem yourself and seeing if you can do all this on your own, then use the video to help check your work. All right, other than that, have a good day. This is Mr. M signing off.